Hello, and welcome to the Semiconductor Industry Association's public webinar series, where we address current issues impacting the global semiconductor industry and market. My name is Falanya Nog. I'm the Director for Industry Statistics and Economic Policy at SIA, and I'll be your host and moderator for today's webinar. How can the semiconductor industry improve the diversity and inclusion of its workforce? The semiconductor industry recognizes the value of a diverse and inclusive workforce. However, like many sectors, the industry has been challenged in reflecting and benefiting from the full diversity of our country. Industry leaders are working to overcome this challenge through programs and initiatives to recruit, retain, and promote a more diverse and inclusive workforce. Where have these programs been successful? Where can they improve? And what lessons has the industry learned from them? We are very fortunate to be joined today by a group of distinguished panelists who will explore these and other questions around what the semiconductor industry is doing to improve diversity and inclusion within its workforce. Ms. Sharon Connors is Vice President of Diversity, Equality and Inclusion at Micron Technology. Sharon leads the DEI function within Micron's people organization that touches all aspects of the business, particularly attracting and supporting a diverse and talented workforce around the globe. Passionate about education and coaching, Connors is also an adjunct professor at Saint San Jose State University and a mentor to first generation and underrepresented, underrepresented college students. Connors holds a bachelor's degree in history from the California State University and a master's degree in human resources management from the Golden Gate University, San Francisco. Welcome, Sharon. Thank you. Ms. Joy DeTore is IBM's global diversity and inclusion leader and has more than 15 years of broad experience in the technology industry and the IBM line of business. In her role, she drives work, workplace engagement activities across more than 14 diverse community groups in support of talent acquisition, career development, employee retention, and engagement. She is responsible for creating, driving, and implementing innovative DNI solutions that scale globally and create business impact. Joy is recognized as the catalyst behind IBM's eight bar rainbow logo and has co-authored an industry white paper. She also is recognized as, as an industry speaker and certified coach. Joy has her undergraduate degree from Ohio State University, a master's in international human resources management from Florida International University, and is currently a doctoral student at Vanderbilt University. Joy, welcome to you. Thank you for having me, Falan. Emily Riley is Senior Vice President and human resource, human, Chief Human Resources Officer at Global Foundries. Emily has worldwide responsibility for all aspects of strategic human resources at Global Foundries, including talent and leadership development, delivering world-class people solutions, and shaping the company's culture. A member of the company's original startup team, Emily joined Global Foundries in 2009 and has been instrumental in Global Foundry's growth into a thriving global organization of, or of over 15,000 employees across 20 locations. She and CEO Tom Caulfield are visible leaders with a personal commitment to diversity, inclusion, and belonging for the Global Foundry's organization and within the semiconductor industry. Emily holds a bachelor's of science degree in industrial engineering from Cornell University. As an engineer, she worked in several roles with GE Advanced Materials, Momenta Performance Materials, over the course of her 14-year tenure, Emily held leadership roles in both engineering and human resources, and prior to joining Global Foundries, held an HR leadership role for engineering within the GE Energy business. Emily, welcome to you. Thank you very much for having me, Salon. And last, but certainly not least, Mr. Ruben Miller is currently a director in Intel, Intel's Human Resources Global Diversity, Inclusion, and Social Impact Office. He is responsible for Intel's Employee Resource Groups, ERG, uh, the Wormline Retention Program, Inclusion, Scholar, and Great Place to Work programs. His department is also responsible for the implementation for the policies that are developed out of the group's global strategy and policy office. Ruben is a human resources, supply chain, operations, and process improvement professional, and has worked for Intel for 23 years in various locations around the globe. Ruben is originally from Macon, Georgia, where he attended Mercer University there and graduated with, graduated with a BBA degree along with an Army Officer Commission. He served six honorable years in the Army, was deployed in Desert Shield, Desert Storm, and reached the rank of Captain. While working for Intel, he received his Executive MBA from Arizona State in 2004. And more recently, in March 2021, Ruben successfully completed the Diversity and Inclusion Certificate Program at Cornell University. Ruben, welcome to you. 
Thanks for having me, Falan. Now, before exploring with you all a number of specific themes related to today's topic, I'd like to first kick off our conversation by asking each of our panelists to provide some background on their company's diversity and inclusion programs and initiatives and what they aim to do. So, uh, Sharon Connors, let's start with you. Can you briefly tell us about Micron's diversity and inclusion programs and initiatives? I'd love to, Flan. First, I just want to start by saying thank you to SIA for hosting today's webinar. This topic is so very important, and we really need partners like SIA to help promote a strong semiconductor industry and, and shine a light on diversity, equality, and inclusion. So thank you. Um, a little bit about Micron. We're the only U.S.-based supplier of DRAM memory technology and the world's largest semiconductor manufacturers of leading-edge memory and storage technologies. We actually began in 1978 um, in, in a dental office, in the basement of a dental office, if you can believe that. Um, and today, 40 years later, we've grown into a leading global semiconductor company, and we're now the only pure play memory company in the Western Hemisphere. So we have currently operations in 17 countries. We have over 40,000 employees worldwide and, and over 20 billion in revenue in FY20. So when you think of about that, it's really important to look at that from a diversity lens as you're bringing all of these different cultures um, together to all work towards the vision of transforming how the world uses information to enrich life. And we recently added for all to our vision statement. So in order to um, produce products for all, we need everyone designing those products and helping us to innovate. And so that's why we're keenly focused on diversity, equality, and inclusion. And what we've done um, this year is we've set six diversity, equality, and inclusion initiatives. So we wanted to come out externally with our commitment to ensure not only within the four walls of Micron, but also in the communities in which we live, work, and play, we are pushing for inclusion for everyone. And so we are focused on um, increasing representation of underrepresented groups, like many companies, no surprises there. Um, we're also focused on engaging with minority-owned financial institutions for our cash management. And this is really important because we don't want to look at diversity and quality and inclusion just through the lens of the talent life cycle. We also want to infuse it into all parts of our business. We are focused on strengthening a culture of inclusion. So we want to make sure when our team members come to work, not only do we have diversity and representation, but everyone feels that they have the opportunity to share their ideas. Otherwise, we're not getting the return on investment from that diverse talent. With everything that happened last year, and it was a lot, Falon, um, we really felt that there was an opportunity to advocate for racial and LGBTQ plus equality around the globe, right? We know um, in the US, there's been a lot of racial tension that we're still experiencing now, and there's opportunity for companies to really be a catalyst for change. And then if you look globally, we know we have a large footprint in Asia. We know that in any many parts of Asia, the LGBTQ LGBT um, community is still criminalized today. And so we wanted to make a commitment to really push for social justice and human rights. We're also focused on driving um, equitable pay and benefits. We believe everyone should be paid fairly for the work that they do. And we want our team members focused on innovation, um, not concerned that they're not being um, paid fairly. That's something that's really important to our leadership, to our team members. Um, and then lastly, we're focused on on increasing diverse supplier representation and spend. So last year we spent $101 million with diverse suppliers. We wanna double that by fiscal year 23. So that's a little bit about our diversity program, our commitments and why it's important to us at Micron. Appreciate that. Thank you, Sharon. Um, I wanna move over to you, Joy, because I know IBM is of all the, all the four companies represented the oldest, uh, having its origins dating back to the late 1800s. Yeah. and has a deep history of more than over hundred years of experience with diversity, inclusion, and equality in the workplace. I imagine, uh, I wanted to ask you more about what is uh, IBM's DNI philosophy, given that I'm sure the programs and initiatives that you've done over the decades um, uh, can, can, can take up more than a whole hour. Um, can you give us a little sense of, of sort of what your, what IBM's uh, philosophy is? 
Yeah, thank you, Falan. And Sharon, thank you so much. It was so great to follow Sharon because she said so many great things that really resonate with the IBM footprint. But like all of our panelists today, IBM is a data-driven, human-centered, evidence-based technology company. And we've always relied on two things, research and science. And this is what thousands of experts have always shared. And it hasn't changed. It is absolutely an undeniable fact that a diverse and inclusive workplace leads to things like greater innovation, agility, performance, engagement. And how about some of the things that Sharon said just around satisfied employees, making sure that they all feel welcomed. And when you create that kind of experience, what we've discovered is yes, it absolutely stimulates business growth, but it also enables us to do something bigger than our company. And Sharon alluded to this, and that is how about doing something with social impact? Can we, through our innovations, make communities safer and healthier through technology, through research and through science? And we've discovered that through technology, we can actually make organizations more human. And so the answer is yes. Think about the research that's being done just around the area of exclusion and the personal impact that has on our teams. So our philosophy has always been to rely on science, discovery, and our corporate values, which are really rooted in trust and responsibility, where we really think about the human side of our business and how the human aspects of our business, they matter. So we've always believed, like you stated, Falan, dating back to 1899, IBM was implementing programs and policies that fostered a culture of inclusion. So all IBMers, I'm going to hit on Sharon's point, so that all IBMers could thrive at work because of who they are. Appreciate that. Yeah. And I like the point uh, that you underscored about not just, you know, having these programs benefit your 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 companies and be doing the right thing and ben benefiting the bottom line but actually also being having a social impact you know going beyond just your company's uh, you know sort of work so i want to turn to you ruben miller um can you give us a sense of uh, what is ibm's uh, diversity inclusion program and initiatives uh, include and give us uh, an overview yes i, I could share with you the the intel diversity and inclusion program uh, and I think you will see in our sharing, especially coming from semiconductor companies, that we have a lot of similarities. So it was, it was good to hear some of the same programs uh, that, that we have in place. Uh, at Intel, our, our goal, our mission is to be the most inclusive and responsible company on the planet. That's, that's our North Star. And, uh, and diversity inclusion they are core to our Intel values and instrumental in driving innovation and delivering stronger business growth. So at Intel, we, we believe in inclusion instills a culture where, as mentioned before, where people feel that they can bring their true and authentic selves and contribute. That's our goal. So it's really been a journey for us at Intel in uh, 2015 we announced plans to achieve full representation of underrepresented minorities and women in the US uh, by 2020. It was a five-year commitment. We invested $300 million in, in several programs to include, include in, in, in improving our pipeline. We established a five-year relationship with the Unified, uh, with Oakland Unified School District to introduce STEMs to kids in the elementary school and we also established a, a partnership with six HBCUs, Historical Black Colleges and Universities. So again, our goal was to meet full representation of underrepresented uh, minorities and women in five years. We achieved that goal two years ahead of time. So mm -hmm. at, at Intel, as, as we know with several companies, sometimes they lead with inclusion, they may lead with diversity, our goal was to get our diversity numbers straight first. Uh, we believe that you cannot include who you exclude. So when we met our diversity numbers, we said, now let's pivot on inclusion. How can we create an environment where people belong, where they are valued and respected so that they can contribute for the reasons that we hired them? So, Again, we have to keep the momentum around diversity. We, want, we don't want to lose that traction, 
but also let's focus on inclusion. And inclusion at Intel, believe, happens in the business unit. So we have a, a program which is under my umbrella called the Inclusion at Intel uh, program, where it's a one-stop shopping of tools, training, templates, videos, blogs around inclusion, training around unconscious, uh, unconscious bias, uh, micro inequities, uh, microaggression, because we think it's important. Again, when you have the diversity, you have to make sure that people feel included. So it's been a journey for us, and when we are well on our way on, on this in inclusion uh, uh, journey. Let me just mention one other thing. Uh, we, we also push our uh, diversity inclusion program through our employee resource groups. We have over 30 employee resource groups and seven leadership council, which are the director members of those employee resource groups. And we really leverage them to promote our diversity and inclusion initiatives. As a matter of fact, when we develop our, our strategies, we leverage the employee resource group members to co-design our goals. And they are truly implementers once we develop those, those strategies. Uh, we have about 26,000 employees, which is about a quarter of uh, the 110,000 employees at Intel across the globe who are members of our ERGs. And we found them to be the most inclusive and the, and the ones who are the most engaged. And we have them embedded into the business units. They can uh, continue to, to promote our DNI initiatives. Appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Ruben. Appreciate that. I will get back to you. I want to uh, explore a little bit more with you about the, the numbers that you guys have really uh, focused on in terms of measuring uh, the, the, the progress that you've made. Um, but I want to turn to you first, Emily, uh, um, before that, because uh, I want to hear from you. I know you shared with me earlier um, that uh, that uh, the that the, that you initiated the your DNI program a little under two years ago, uh, so it's relatively new compared to you know I you know Joy uh, at IBM sort of on the other side of the spectrum. Can you tell us about the steps you've taken to develop the program and, and catalyze your vision as a as a relatively new program? Sure. And um, we're a 12 year old company at Global Foundries and we had some really wonderful, what I would call activity, um, you know, happening over the years in, in various, you know, good areas of diversity and inclusion. But it wasn't until uh, 2018 when Tom Caulfield became our CEO um, that his leadership and vision and passion and commitment around diversity and inclusion really began a strong focus on this as integral to our company. And you know, as we work with Tom and as he helps us to drive this, he is you know, fully understanding the benefit that this can have for our company, for innovation and for business in general. Um, he's also extremely involved and passionate and working very closely with us on the culture of our company um, you know, every single day. He also knows it's the right thing to do and is an individual who is just a great person and all of that um, really helps to build the, um, you know, the agenda and what we're doing in all of our people areas. So we had, you know, first and foremost, a leader that was leading this with us. Um, we formed a diversity and inclusion advocacy group of additional, you know, set of the senior executives in the company, and they're very active um, in helping us to lead as well. And we, like, um, like others, have pillars of our diversity and inclusion program, which include growing representation, inclusive leadership, and driving a, an inclusive environment. Um, also, um, opportunities, equal opportunities for success is a third. And the fourth is that we very much aspire to be recognized as a leader in the semiconductor industry in diversity, inclusion, and belonging. And you know, opportunities like this, as well as just some really incredible networking and partnerships that happen, you know, inside and outside the company are, are truly incredible. I think it's a very selfless, um, you know, a selfless way to work together because we all have many of the same challenges and opportunities and to learn and benefit from each other, especially in the last year has been so necessary and so welcomed and everyone's been very open to that. So um, it's wonderful to be here today with everybody because I think we're all very committed to uh, advancing diversity, inclusion and belonging and equity um, in the semiconductor industry. So 
Um, great to be here with everybody. We're a little earlier in our journey um, and it's wonderful to learn from people and also share, you know, as we're learning and building, you know, this within our company. Thank you, Emily. I appreciate that. And I, I, maybe something we can get to later on in the discussion, but you know, the role that your CEO, Tom Caulfield, has played in terms of leading um, is something that maybe um, uh, we can talk about a little more, not just having the, um, the head of the company really prioritize uh, diversity and inclusion uh, and, and that impact, that important impact that from the leader that, 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 that causes, but also to trying to get uh, uh, folks uh, uh, who uh, you know underrepresented minorities and people of color and women in those positions to then you know become leaders themselves, right? So, um, but first, let me go ahead and uh, I wanted to pick up on something that I think uh, maybe that both Joy and Sharon had mentioned, which is about the business case uh, for uh, having diversity and inclusion within uh, your companies. Um, Joy, perhaps perhaps you could start. Can you give us um, give us the business case for why diversity and inclusion is not only the right thing to do? but also helps improve the bottom line for companies such as IBM. Yeah, and Falana, if you don't mind, I don't wanna rush past the first part of that question because of something that Emily said, and I really love the point, and that was about being selfless. So as an HR professional, and we talked about this at the very beginning of the introductions, um, we're all HR professionals here. And I have this personal philosophy, and the personal philosophy goes something like this, and it complements what Emily said about being selfless. And my, my philosophy is if we ever forget for one moment that the H in our title stands for human, mm -hmm. then it's probably time for all of us to find another profession. And so today, even though I'm a global leader in diversity and inclusion, with that gift also comes profound responsibility to IBMers all around the world. And so I don't want to be negligent about what's happening in our world today. So even as HR professionals, as we sit back and say, gosh, have we ever felt things like being isolated or judged or criticized? Have we ever felt that we could not be ourselves at, at work because of things like fear, intimidation, and harassment? Could we understand how important creating a safe workplace is, not only because of our professional lives, but for our personal well-being? So we are all seeking some sense of belonging at work, a place where we can feel things like safe, welcome, and included. And as we are listening to all of the panelists today, and I love the pre-conversation because there's one thing that we all know. The one thing that we all know that's certain is that current workforce trends and social situations are pointing to challenges like hashtag me too, press for progress, stop Asian hate, black lives matter, time's up, no ban, no wall won't be erased in say our name. We are experiencing a time of unprecedented need for things like compassion, kindness, justice, dignity, unity. And do I dare introduce a brand new four letter word to business how about love? And for anybody where me using the word love in a business context made you feel a little wiggle in your seat uncomfortable, all of our businesses are dependent upon relationships. We are in the relationship management business. So remove love and talk about trust. And if those hashtags were not enough to really explain why the human part of our business matters, then let's talk about things like COVID-19, xenophobia, immigration reform, DACA, an economic crisis, and the U.S. Supreme Court's influencing decisions about LGBT inclusion and marriage equality. And I think if there's anything that we're discovering is when diversity and inclusion, as it's becoming this mainstream conversation for corporations, many of them have been caught in headlines centered around things like race, gender, harassment, discrimination, and religious freedom all of the companies on this phone and those that are actually listening, we're all scrambling because what are we trying to do? We're trying to identify modern ways to react because these uprisings, they're impacting our teams. All of it is coming into the workplace. So our new mental models are demanding a novel level of consciousness, intentional allyship, color awareness and appreciation. And I, I don't wanna ignore the fact that how many of us have continued to remain in touch with our Black colleagues after the death of George Floyd. And now the start of his trial. What is that doing to the psychological state 
of our Black IBMers? And then how many of us with care and compassion and sensitivity have reached out to our Pan-Asian coworkers after an increase in anti-Asian sentiment, which we know just based on statistics is up 149% in the past year. So as a kind of parting comment, when people say, it's not personal, hmm. it's only business. It is always personal. As HR professionals, everything that we do and our businesses engage in, it impacts people. And not only the individuals that are impacted by our workplace policies, but our families and our communities. So for IBM, improving the bottom line always means doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. That's very, I appreciate your passion that you, you, you bring to that response and, and, and understanding the the, the, the connection really between the business and the world, right? And what's going on in the world and being aware of that as a company. Um, Sharon, uh, can I uh, ask you the same question? Yeah, wow, Joy, uh, you just, you you hit home with that one, I must say. Um, a lot of our, our team members are struggling with psychological safety and it's almost impossible to do your best work when you don't feel safe, right? And and so I, I think you hit it dead on. Not only is this the right thing to do and it's good for business, um, but it's really about providing an environment and an opportunity for our team members to, to understand how they can create that psychological safety for their peers um, to ensure that, that you know, we don't continue to repeat these patterns, right? And how can we show up differently? So thank you for highlighting that. Um, I wanna give a shout out to Ruben who, who brought up Oakland Public Schools. I am a product of Oakland Public Schools and I'm, I can certainly say there is a lot of work to do around equality and uh, preparing students um, in those types of environments to sit in this seat where I am today and have these conversations. What I wanted to share about um, the business case for diversity and inclusion is if you take a Sharon Connors who grew up in, in East Oakland and you put her in the room with someone who grew up in Boise, Idaho, who has a very different background, and you bring in someone from Taiwan and Japan, right? As we're looking for um, solutions to problems and we're having discussions, something magical happens within that, right? You get the diversity of all those different perspectives. And the way I'm thinking about it is totally different, I can guarantee you, than how my peer in Boise, Idaho is thinking about that problem, the opportunities, right? And ultimately driving us to those solutions. That is the business case for diversity, equality, and inclusion. Now, a very tangible, I'd like to pull two very tangible examples, um, one from another company and one from Micron. So you all may not know, but one of the most popular um, uh, Dorito flavored chips is the guacamole chip. And that chip made millions of dollars in revenue, right, for Frito-Lay. But, but how did that chip come about? You all would be surprised to know it was the employee resource group, the Hispanic employee resource group that said, hey, wow, really? I think there's an opportunity here for something that's missing in the market that our community in particular would be very interested in. And so they had the inception for this chip. They helped with the flavoring of it. They tested it, right? All of that was done and, and it grows so much revenue for that company. So that's a fantastic example. Ruben was talking about the power of ERGs. It's not only about creating inclusion, absolutely they do and we need that, but it's also about the impact to the business, right? And, and the example. innovation, yeah, within the business. Yeah. Now, we make chips at Micron, but not that, <laughs> that kind of chip. Um, yeah. But what I wanna highlight is out of our women's employee resource group, we started a WIN program, and that is a Women Innovate program. And we have, for the first time out of that program, 50 first-time inventors with patents. That is a big deal for Micron, right? That is driving our innovation. So we are pulling those women together. We're coaching them on how to secure a patent. We're walking them through the process. Um, and to date, we have 80 patents that have come out of that WIN group. And now what we're doing is we are pushing that program to our other ERGs, right? So we can continue to 
drive that innovation within the company. So that's another very tangible example of the real business case, right? So not only is it about creating community, as Joy pointed out, and making sure that we all feel safe in that human element, um, but it, it, it's also the right thing to do, and it's good for business, right? This, I mean, they're, you're winning on every side when you devote time, resources to diversity, equality, and inclusion. Yeah, and I was I was going to ask one thing: the importance too of yes, you if you have a diverse workforce, but being sure that you ask them about, you know, being sure giving giving them a platform to say like, let's give give me your opinion, give me your thoughts on this. I mean, I mean, I think that having that ability, being sure that you do that, I think is probably another major component of of being sure that you you leverage all the that those diverse perspectives that you you may have in a company may not be aware of. So. Um, Appreciate that. Anyone else want to, uh, uh, any other thoughts from the others on, on, on this topic? All right. Um, let me go ahead and um, I want to, um, I know we got a lot of, a lot of other themes I want to cover. So I um, want to get back to you, Ruben, because um, I want to touch up upon uh, sort of the metrics that Intel has really applied to this, because I think it's, it's really instructive. I know we've all heard the adage, you know, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And I think that's something that uh, Intel has really, um, in your example, have done, has really done a, a great job with. Um, how does Intel, I guess, define success in terms of having a diverse and inclusive workforce? And more importantly, uh, what are the details and how do you, me how do you, how do you measure it? Because I think you, you, you've, you've come up with certain benchmarks. You mentioned, you know, the five-year plan exceeding that. Um, I think a lot of folks, perhaps on the call, it could, could, could benefit from hearing about um, sort of the, the, your approach. Thanks, Falan. Uh, but yeah, I would, I would love to share how we go about measuring the numbers. But before I do that, I would like to uh, share with Emily, it was mentioned that I received my diversity and inclusion certificate uh, from eCornell, from the Cornell University. I know you're, you graduated from Cornell Uni University, so go red. <laughs> uh, but one of the things that came out of that course, which was interesting, it has to do with the question is that the professor made the statement that diversity is about counting numbers, inclusion is about making those numbers count. Mm. And that really resonated with me. And, and by the way, I'm giving a plug for the E. Cornell uh, Diversity and Inclusion Program. It, uh, it was, it, which by the way, I, I, I received this past Monday and it's a very impressive program, which they take a science-based approach to understanding why, why do companies have diversity and inclusion challenges within their, within their company, and it, and it provides facts, data, and research to come up with solutions. So there's a plug for the Cornell University. So at, at, at Intel, within our diversity and inclusion department, we have an analy analytics team, uh, a four-person team, and they leverage our human resource data, which we, we have in Workday, to really provide tools and templates on measuring representation, right? At Intel, we believe, and I'm sure it's the same at other companies too, that to, to increase on representation, it's a three-pronged approach. It's about hiring, it's about retention, and it's about progression. And at Intel, we believe that you must do all three extremely well, right? You can't over index on, on hiring when you can't retain them. And mm -hmm. you surely can't retain them if you can't progress them. So that's our focus yeah. at Intel on, the, on that three-pronged approach. And just recently, uh, last year, and, and every 10 years, we create what we call our sustainability and and, uh, and social goals, uh, our CRO goals, every 10 years. And, and last year, we created uh, workforce uh, diversity goals around women and underrepresented minorities. For example, we have a goal to increase uh, the, the percent of uh, women technical members from 25% to 40% in 10 years. Our goal is to double the number of women leaders at Intel leaders are defined as directors and above to increase, to double that number in 10 years, to also double the number of underrepresented minorities, under, underrepresented minorities at Intel are African-Americans, uh, Hispanic American and Native American Indian, to double that number of, of leaders, URM leaders in 10 years. So in order to do that, 
we need to provide our business units the tools to, to make that progression, all right, to increase the representation, taking that three-pronged approach. At, at Intel, we really believe that that work happens within the business unit. We try to make it very clear that, that at, at Intel, yes, we, we don't pr uh, progress, we don't hire, right? we don't retain, but we give the business units tools in order to do those things well. And it's really a partnership. Uh, and we provide a scorecard that the business units can see their, uh, their performance against those, those goals that I mentioned before, we call the RISE goals around being responsible, being inclusive, being sustaining. And the E is enabling our technology and, a, and our employees to reach those goals. Mm -hmm. So the key, it, it really happens at the business unit and from, diver and from our department, from a diversity inclusion perspective, our goal is to give them the tools and templates, the training, the advice, the consulting to achieve those goals. Thank you, Ruben, appreciate that. Uh, Emily, I want to turn to you. Um, I want to ask uh, some of the, about some of the challenges you faced and what lessons you've learned, given that your sort of relatively your program at Global Foundries is uh, relatively new compared to the others. I think that's a, a pretty helpful perspective, certainly for a lot of the other folks maybe on the call who are also, you know, beginning or, or, or in the nascent stages of of doing a diversity inclusion program. Yeah, so I think um, there's a few that I would mention, and they're related uh, as well to what some of the other speakers have mentioned. Um, and the first one I would say is that as we have been introducing either new programs or new dialogue, um, best way to describe it is that there's so much readiness and pent up demand for what employees want to receive, want to be involved in, and how they want to dialogue that you know, you have to provide very little spark in order to open the hearts and the minds of employees to want to be involved or to maybe just want to be more demanding um, of their company, you know, to be a better company and to open up in this space. So um, one, of the, one of the incredible learnings that we've had is, you know, the employee readiness um, was there, you know, all along. And, and every time we're introducing something new, um, the organization is just absolutely ready to engage or to dialogue around it. And I would say that, you know, if you're considering what we've learned is if you're considering doing something or trying to figure out the right timing or whether or not we're ready for something, we're probably already late. Right. So <laughs> uh, that, that's that been one learning that the organization is just really, you know, really hungry, you know, to engage. Um, another learning that we've had and it's touched, been touched on a little bit here is that while there are many, you know, unifying um, things that you need to do, you know, within, within an organization with respect to diversity and inclusion, how you do that depending upon the culture or the geography or the experiences of, you know, the individuals in a global company um, that we all have um, can be different. So we may have a unified objective, but we've had to revisit some of our programming and some of our training. Um, and it always helps to pilot things because we learn how this is going to resonate, you know, within different locations and cultures. So we've had to do some reprogramming because, you know, we may have, um, you know, needed to customize certain things based on people's understanding and perspective. So in a global organization, you know, we've had that learning as well. And the last thing that I would say in, you know, again, so true this year is that you really have to meet people where they are and wherever they are, it's okay. And I've used an analogy before of, of swimming. There's people that they'll dive right in the waterhead first and they'll get going, you know, in diversity and inclusion because, you know, it's something that's close to them already or perhaps they know, you know, a lot about. There's others that are gonna wade into the water a bit more slowly, but they're they're willing to do it, but they're going to need some help. And then there's people that might dip their toe in the water to discover what it's all about. And then there's others who just don't know how to swim, uh, you know, at all. And I think, you know, the learning we've had is that's all perfectly okay. Everybody mm -hmm. is at a different starting point. And, you know, even, you know, they're, they're at a different perspective. 
and to just have the openness to learn how to meet people where they are and then take it and then take it forward um, and really know that everyone's not going to be in the same spot. So and be comfortable with that and know that it's OK to be you know, fluid, um, you know, learn about where people are and help them to the next you know, step. So, you know, we're really living, you know, through each day and, and moment here in building our program at the same time that we're having to, you know, respond to so many things happening in the world that I think, you know, meeting people where they are is very healthy and an important part of all of this work. Yeah, no, there's a lot. Of, thanks. Thanks for that. I think there's a lot of helpful um, advice that you provided there, Emily, that um, I'm sure we can talk a little bit more about. But one thing that you did mention that I do want to um, do, do want to sort of explore a little bit more now um, uh, is the idea of, you know, sort of of adjusting uh, or, or, or recalibrating your program based on you know sort of the vast the, the various locations that you, that you're that you're that you're in and, and all of your companies are all globally have a global footprint right and so um, I wanted to uh, mention this uh, and and see if uh, a couple of you could 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 touch upon this a bit um, I know Ruben Intel you know you mentioned 100 hundred thousand plus 120 thousand uh, so employees globally right um, uh, global footprint obviously challenges to that uh, in terms of in different cultures, uh, you know, having to adjust uh, to, you know, programs. Uh, can you talk to us a bit more about what Emily mentioned about the challenges and opportunities of establishing and running an effective diversity inclusion program um, um, uh, within, a, within, a, within an organization that has, that is so global? Great, Thank, thanks for that. It, it is a challenge. Uh, I consider myself to be in a fortunate situation because uh, the, the director who runs our employee resource groups and our inclusion programs, she happens to be based in the UK. So uh, when, when things may get escalated and they may need a, a, leader, a leader's lens to it, she and I are able to provide leader support around the clock. <laughs> so, so when she's down having dinner, I'm working. And, and I, I, I wish I could take the credit of saying that, that, that I designed that, but it's, we're fortunate enough to be in a situation like that. However, in addition, what we did do intentionally is that we do have uh, employees who are based of, around the globe. We have employees in Costa Rica, Israel, Ireland, Malaysia, China, who are working in global diversity and inclusion. So even though they may represent their primary initiative, if it's, if it's women initiatives or inclusion program, or in that region, they know that they represent our department. So if something may come, that may come up outside of their primary scope, they know that they're representing global diversity, inclusion, and social impact in those particular areas. So we, get, we have pretty good coverage. And, and this, uh, what we've had to uh, pivot to because of the COVID environment only, only helps us in so many ways. In, a, in addition, we have the, the warm line program, and I wanna make sure we don't run out of time to talk about this particular program, uh, which it started in 2016 as a, as a retention uh, program. Uh, initially, we, and this was part of the 2015 goals, right? We wanted to make sure that we retain key talent. And initially when we rolled out the warm line uh, program, the goal was to retain women and underrepresented minorities. However, when we eventually rolled it out, we opened it up to all. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, we started in the US, and now we have uh, begun to expand it outside of the US in those regions that I've mentioned. And what's interesting, when some people may see, and, and again, the Warm Line program is a confidential employee resource in which employees come to my, our online case advisors with issues and concerns. It could be around integration. It could be around manager conflict or when they may want to make a career change. But the, the client, the employee would come to our online case advisors and they would partner on a solution to resolve their situation. To date, we have an 86% retention rate of the employees who come to the uh, warm line program. So that's essentially eight out of, eight out of 10 employees. Uh, out of our surveys on a, school, on a scale of one to five, with, uh, uh, we, we, they are, we are averaging a four plus on a scale of one to five with five being high. 
And uh, from our surveys, we, we've, uh, we know that 91% of the employees who go through the warm line program would recommend it to others. So now we're, as part of our RISE 2030 goals, we're about to implement an executive warm line program. Warm line is available to all, all, uh, all employees, but we thought we would have a more customized, tailored program to really focus on the needs to retain our key talent, our key executives. And we'll be rolling out that program uh, real soon. Again, the strategy is to meet uh, increasing, doubling the number of URM leaders and women leaders. Excellent. Well, uh, Ruben, I don't know. You, I, I suspect many of the um, uh, the people on the call may be taking notes and may want to talk talk with you afterwards about this program. Uh, it sounds sounds quite uh, quite successful and get get catch, get some notes on that. So, um, but I wanted to ask you, Sharon, uh, the same question about um, your Global Footprint and Micron. And you know, I know Micron headquartered in Boise, Idaho. Um, I've never been to Boise, Boise, Idaho. Even the footprint, uh, you know, in terms of like you know the tech and, and you know probably is pretty broad for your company just in the U.S. Um, but uh, tell us. Uh, you know, tell some of the challenges with, um, you know, sort of having a uh, doing uh, having a diversity inclusion program and and being such a having such a global footprint. I know you have facilities in, in Singapore and in Taiwan and and Japan. Um, tell us about that. Yeah, we're, you are absolutely right. We are headquartered in Boise, Idaho, which is beautiful. You definitely should I take need a to go. trip I need there. To go. Yes. Um, and, and we do have um, a, a large operation in Asia, for sure. And so we definitely have um, some lessons learned. I love what... Um, Emily talked about meeting people where they are. Uh, we talk a lot at Micron around no judgment, right? So we're not gonna judge where you are. And I think that's important when you think about diversity, equality and inclusion globally, because every country is in a different place, right? Even regions of the country are in a different place on their journey. Um, and so we want to not pass judgment, but we want to meet our leaders and team members where they are and help them to develop a growth mindset in this area and to continue and to support them on this journey. So I think that that's really important. Um, one thing that I have seen companies do um, when you're looking at a global footprint, it's easy to over index on gender. Um, but I, and gender, there's nothing wrong with that. That's a great place to start, but there's definitely an opportunity to sharpen your pencil and to really dive in and do some focus groups to understand the cultural nuances and where there is opportunity opportunity around DEI depending on the country, right? So for example, if I look at Japan, in Japan, we tend to have a lot of opportunity around um, power uh, harassment and, and hierarchy, right? And we want all team members to be able to speak up regardless of where they are in that hierarchy. Because again, we want to benefit from their voice, their ideas around innovation. That's a very different um, opportunity than perhaps if you move to um, the US where we're seeing a lot of uh, racial microaggressions, right? So it's important that we have a global strategy so globally we may say yes we're gonna we're gonna get rid of microaggressions in our company that is not acceptable but but that may look very different for Japan versus Taiwan versus the US versus Singapore so really what you are gonna have to do is take your global programs and make sure not only that you're translating them but that you're localizing them and a fantastic way to do that is exactly what Ruben said we are structured the same way so we have DEI business partners in each of our regions right Right? And not only are they looking internally at Micron, but they're also focused on what's going on externally in the environment, right? Because as Joy said earlier, all that external stuff is impacting how your team members show up. And so we have been very intentional around designing um, our DEI uh, commitments, but then local programs that support those opportunities in those regions. And, and Nicole, I want to give you a shout out for being so active in the chat. We do have different diversity goals based on the country, right? And the opportunities that we have there, certainly. Um, so I, I would encourage everyone to look at it through that lens and not try, it's not cookie cutter. You can't have um, a DEI program that's going to work the same 
in every single country. And so I just want to call that out. That certainly has been um, an opportunity at Micron. And I would say the key is getting your structure right and making sure you have intelligence into what's going on on the ground, listening to your team members. We do a lot of focus groups mm -hmm. so we can get that feedback. And ERGs are an incredible resource. So we have over 25 new chapters, ERG chapters uh, just last year. We, we saw 84% growth in our ERGs. And those are globally around the world. And we're able, again, when you talk about making a business impact, we can tap into those groups to understand, are they feeling seen, heard, valued, respected? Do they feel safe when they come to work? And we're able to use that network to quickly um, be able to respond and make adjustments where necessary. Excellent. Thanks, uh, Sharon. Sharon, I just want to follow up with you. Um, Ruben had mentioned something uh, in terms of the strategy um, for uh, DNI and uh, in, at Intel, hiring, retaining, and progressing. Right, and yeah. um, th that's uh, I wanted to touch on uh, on that, and, and particularly um, the, the, the 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 two second parts of that. Hiring the right people uh, is is key, but the retaining and promoting piece uh, is is equally important. Uh, what 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 sort of um, what sort of work uh, can you can you can you um, explain uh, share with us that that Micron is doing uh, to help with um, with the with the retaining and promoting of, of uh, women and, and people of color within within your ranks? Yeah, thank you for asking that. I think uh, Ruben was dead on with those three buckets. Yeah. Uh, I love to say you can't hire your way out of bad retention. So you can bring in diverse talent all day, but if they don't stay, you're going to have a problem. You're, you're just yeah. spinning your wheels. Um, so I do want to start on the hiring side, though, because as Ruben said, you got to get diversity in, right? That 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 is step one. So what we've done is we have inclusive hiring practices. So number one, um, hopefully everybody's familiar with diverse slate for Every opening at Micron, we require at least two members of an underrepresented group be considered for every opening that we have. We also implemented diverse interview teams. And what that means is when you walk into Micron and, and you're in an interview, you're going to see someone that has some diversity el element to them, right? Because it's important for our candidates to know we represent the communities in which we live, work, and play. And, and those folks have a voice in our company. So we thought that that was really important. We are a technology company, so we use text and eightfold to make sure that our job descriptions aren't biased and that we're attracting all types of talent. And we also want to broaden the net of where we're looking. So those tools allow us to data mine and find diverse talent that would normally be top of mind or accessible to us. Um, we've also implemented a underrepresented group referral bonus program. So we want our team members engaged. We want them helping us to find the best and brightest talent. And so we want to reward that behavior. And then lastly, I want to call out, we have specialty partners. So nobody does this work alone. We partner with the National Society of Black Engineers, the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, SWE, Grace Hopper, right? We need to work together um, to help cultivate and, and acquire this talent. That's a very important piece of it. So that's the hiring piece, right? Now, what happens when that talent walks in the door, right? That's, to me, that's the inclusion piece. Do, are they respected? Do they feel valued. And so our ERGs play a very important role with helping our diverse talent on board into our organization, creating that sense of community and that safety and really engaging them. We actually see a 3% um, higher engagement score with, with our ERG members than with the rest of our team members. So we know that that's, that is working. Um, and we also measure inclusion through our um, engagement survey. We actually have an inclusion index with questions specifically around around, do you feel seen, heard, valued, respected, right? So there's that, the inclusion piece of it. But then also, you know, how are you being rewarded? And do you have the same opportunities as everyone else? So what we've done in our talent reviews is we've created an inclusion advocate. And that is a person, their only task in the room is to listen to the conversation and call out bias, right? We all have unconscious bias. Again, no judgment. But we want to make sure we're holding ourselves accountable and keeping ourselves honest and that we are focused on um, team member 
performance and not any of those other diversity dimensions, right? And so we have one of those in every single talent review. We've also introduced that in our succession planning as well. And we have a um, separate session where we just look at diverse talent because we wanna make sure that we are putting in adequate time to look at opportunities and make sure that we are cultivating that talent. Um, we also know that sometimes we need to apply some equity. So not everybody is starting from the same place. And so we have a women's advancement program where we look at our um, high potential women talent and we give them a little bit more exposure and access to networks and information and training and coaching to make sure that they're able to reach their highest potential. We wanna invest in that talent. We've done the same thing this year for our black team members. And we are now looking at rolling out that that same, a, a very similar program for our Hispanic team members or people with disabilities and our veterans. So we are very in, um, invested in our diverse talent and we wanna make sure that they don't get overlooked, right? And then lastly, pay. We want to make sure, you know, in order to retain high potential talent, you got to pay them fairly. That's important, right? It is There is a war on talent. Um, so we absolutely have a pay equity study that we run every year. Um, and we've extended that study beyond gender to all underrepresented groups. So those are just a few of the things that we're doing to ensure not only that we're hiring, but we are retaining and advancing that talent. Wonderful. Thank you. I know we're getting close to the top of the hour, but I do want to be sure that I touch upon uh, policy because that is one thing, obviously, at SIA that we are uh, focused on. And I um, wanted to ask you, Joy, um, what should policymakers know about what IBM and what our industry in general is doing to improve diversity and inclusion in the workforce? What, could you, what can you tell folks here in, in D.C. Um, that they should know? Yeah, a couple of things. First of all, I wanted to say to Emily, Sharon, and Ruben, I've been taking notes. And there are a couple of words that you said. Um, everybody is on a journey, the importance of trust and trustworthiness, um, psychological safety, and this whole importance of engagement. So as we think about like policy and policy differences and how do we make a difference, at IBM, our philosophy has always been, can we lead by our example. And so as you think about our leadership team from our most senior leaders, our CEO all the way down, they are 100% committed to promoting and supporting what we call kind of these forward leaning federal and state diversity and inclusion policies that improve the lives of all of our employees. Um, we do have a dedicated team, which I think makes IBM a little bit special here, is that we have senior executives, we have corporate lobbyists, we have HR professionals, we have diversity leaders. And just like many of our um, panelists on the phone, we have employees who deeply want to get engaged and enact change in the country. And so you've got to co-create with them. You've got to create that experience. And so what we're doing is we're engaging in kind of dozens of cross-industry coalitions and in areas where we realize, hey, these coalitions, they don't exist. What we're actually doing is we're creating them. Um, similar to what we're doing here, we're partnering with local chambers of com uh, commerce, advocacy groups, law enforcement, religious groups, think tanks, law firms, and we wanna do all of that because we wanna ensure that federal and state US laws promote non-discrimination protections for all of our communities. So even if IBM was just one voice, we know that our economy works best when our employees um, can be who they are without fear of bias or discrimination and inequality, whether that's in the workplace or in their communities. And Ruben, um, uh, uh, Falan, I want to give you a, a, an example, and again, yes. Ruben touched on this, and it goes back to some policy work that we started a couple of years ago, and this is the first time in the history of our company, we actually got really involved in social justice issues from a legislative perspective, and so a, purpose, a personal example is the bathroom bill. I mean, how many of us had to help our employees as we think about LGBT inclusion and now with the Equality Act front and center, what are we doing to protect our LGBT plus community and in particular, our transgender community that is under attack? And so when we think about what's happening in the Texas state legislator, we talked about that discriminatory bathroom bill that literally would have just prevented individuals from using a public restroom that match their gender identity. 
right? We're in 2021. At yeah. that time, it was the first time IBM was lobbying and engaging lobbyists with social issues. And so we actually had our CHRO and our, um, um, our diversity and inclusion leader, our CDIO, when they found out that there were a group of IBMers, so back to Sharon and Ruben's point about how do you mobilize passionate employees, we went to our business resource groups. When we lobbied in Texas, we have 250 BRGs worldwide. We operate in 179 countries, and we actually touch more than 50,000 employees in those business resource groups. If you don't leverage that group of passionate employees, when you're doing something like really important legislative work with lawmakers, they came with us side by side, knocking on doors, of legislators and talking about where we needed them to be on the right side of that issue. Wow. And our CEO was actually calling governors to talk about what did the right vote look like um, for that legislative issue. And we continue those kinds of practices. Wow, that's inspiring and definitely. Well, this whole conversation has been inspiring um, and I can't believe we're at the top of the hour. If you guys don't mind spending just five more minutes um, I would love, and I know you probably have all in some way it, it will, over the last hour mentioned a, uh, you know, a, a particular program, but I think for the, uh, that has been really um, beneficial for, for your organization. But I think for the benefit of the audience, um, who could just spend like the last uh, a few minutes, if you could go around and just tell us, um, highlight just one. I know you guys seem to uh, have a whole bunch of work that you've done that's, that's super inspiring, but if there's just one program that you could call out and, 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 and say, you know, we're very, um, you know, we're very proud of this program. It's had a major impact um, uh, for us and our company and even more broadly in terms of uh, the diversity and inclusion work that we've done. Um, we'd love to see if we can do that. Um, Emily, why don't we start with you, if you wouldn't mind? Sure. Um, I'd like to share that about a year ago, we enhanced our, um, our, well, we put in place a global parental leave policy and all birth and adoptive parents at Global Foundries um, can take up a minimum of 20 fully paid weeks of time for the birth or adoption of a child. And it has been uh, a program that was uh, you know, very well received internally and externally. And what we're looking to, um, it, it, to do is to have folks think about um, the integration of their life and their career and have Global Foundries be a company um, where they raise their family and not just thinking about getting a job and oh, how, much, how many weeks do I have off, um, but to think that um, we were partners in such an important, you know, time in somebody's life. So that's a program that we um, we launched globally a year, a little over a year ago, and um, we're very proud of that. Um, and you know, we we hope that that's going to really make a lot of lives better for people. Yeah, absolutely. Joy, how about you, IBM? Yeah, you know, I'm gonna got a, a lot of got a lot of history there. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to talk about one that is very personal for me because we talk about you know, the importance of stories right before we all got on this on this phone. And I'm going to stick with the LGBT inclusion and in particular transgender inclusion. Um, one thing that I think that IBM has done really well is help employees successfully transition in the workplace because we know they don't do it alone. It's not just about an individual that's transitioning, their entire teams, their management, their organization. So how do we do that in the most graceful, dignified way. And what we discovered was all of our knowledge was sitting right here, is in our head. And so what we decided was, were there other companies that could actually benefit from the best practices that we call gender transition in the global workplace? Because like my peers on the phone, because we are a global company, and Sharon mentioned this earlier, we actually do business in 27 countries where being a member of the community is criminalized, where somebody could, I mean, like literally lose their life or disappear or lose a limb. And we're not exaggerating. Like that's countries where that's their, their basic philosophy. And so what we decided to do was we co-authored a white paper with the human rights campaign. And it is called Gender Transition in the Global Workplace. Who knew that the first language that um, framework would be translated in was Japanese. So it goes back to Sharon's point earlier, and there's been so much um, discussion in the chat about having this global lens. So the first language we translated in was Japanese, followed by French, followed by Portuguese, and then the last language it was translated in was Spanish. And what happened was we had a very large, important partner of ours who had a senior leader in their business that was transitioning. 
and they didn't know what to do. And that transitioning partner, because they had worked so often with IBM said, if there's a company that's got something out, there's gotta be IBM. And so she started searching on our website and she found it. She found our gender transition in the global workplace white paper. And so our two CHROs talked, I went to the organization and I helped not only this individual transition, but the teams underneath them, their HR departments. And ever since then, we continue to find companies who are locating that document and saying, can I just pull it and use it and replicate it? And the answer is yes. This goes back to trying to have a good corporate social impact and putting something out on our website that we know can be replicated and help other companies. But being personally involved in that experience and many conversations afterwards, seeing an individual who has the opportunity to truly be themselves at work and help their teams get them through that authentic journey. It was one of the most powerful personal experiences I've ever had as an HR profession. Wow. And I'm still in touch with that person today. So talk about deep, meaningful relationships and trust that gets built when you help a person through, through a situation where they're hurting. Yeah, yeah. I guess it goes back to what you said. I think uh, initially, Joy, human, right? It's all about human connections, right? So, wow. Ruben, how about you? I want to uh, be sure I uh, hear about uh, a program you guys are particularly proud of at Intel. Well, I've already talked about Warren Line, so I won't <laughs> repeat that one. And, and we have a strong employee resource program. I, I would like to share, as, as Sharon mentioned, we implemented an inclusive hiring methodology two years ago. Uh, and we set goals, goals of uh, 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 X percent of managers who had to take this inclusive hiring training, which focused on those things I mentioned before about microaggression, unconscious bias. So X percent of managers who had to take the training and an X percent of internal recs that had to be posted. And we set goals for that tied to an annual performance bonus. Based on those goals, we exceeded those goals. So now the next step is to embed those expectations and requirements into the system. Mm. That it, it, it becomes a way in which we instill account accountability to make sure that we are it, 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 uh, adhering to those inclusive hiring method methodology. And even after two years, we have far exceeded the initial goals that we set. So that gives me the impression that now it has become part of our DNA. So that's how we introduced some of our diversity and inclusion initiatives. We put the spotlight on it by tying annual performance bonuses to it. Then once, it, done, once we achieve those, we make sure to, to, re, to reinforce and make them part of our DNA. Wow, perfect. Sharon, I think yeah. you, you, you have, you're the last stuff. Can you uh, share with us uh, um, something that uh, you folks at Micron are particularly proud of? Yes, yeah, so um, I mentioned earlier our, our pay equity study that we run globally for all 40,000 um, team members for all underrepresented groups. So that's people with disabilities globally, women globally in the US, Black, the Latinx community and veterans. So I'm, I'm not gonna spend too much time on that, but I, what I will call out is what Ruben said. For the first time ever this year, we've tied diversity goals to our short-term incentive plan. So for our um, bonus this year for all team members, we we have diversity goals. And one of those goals is around our inclusion ally training. And Joy got me thinking about this because with everything going on with the anti-Asian violence and the trans community under attack, it's so important that we all show up as, as allies. And so each of our nine employee resource groups have their own version of how to be an ally to their particular group. And so some of the content is the same, but then again, some of it is very tailored to those groups. And what's so phenomenal about this training is we have our team members sharing stories. So we have people that identify with those communities in the training share their personal story. And something about that, like training is great, 
but something about when you hear your team member share how they have been impacted, it builds empathy in a way that that normal training doesn't. And so we are requiring all 40,000 of our team members take at least one version of the inclusion ally training. And we found that it's been so impactful. Um, we had leaders crying in these trainings, um, just listening to um, our team members experience and how sometimes they don't feel seen, heard, valued, respected. So I just want to highlight that. I oh, appreciate that, Sean. Well, I know we went a little over, um, but uh, thank you for indulging. But I could stay here for another hour, even more talking about this. This is such an inspiring um, a topic and conversation and uh, and one that needs to that we need to, to have more in our, in our companies. And so I appreciate I appreciate you. You, you, you join the panel and, and sharing with us all the important information, uh, inspiring information um, uh, with, uh, with our audience. Um, uh, uh, Sharon Connors, uh, Emily Riley, Ruben Miller, and Joy DeTore, again, thank you all very much. Uh, and we look to con continue the conversation. We, get a, we got a ton, and thank you all for the panelists for joining. I know we didn't get to the, 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 to the, to the questions that people uh, submitted, but um, I will be sure to pass them on to the panelists and hope you guys can connect offline because I know there are uh, more, more uh, conversations to be had on this topic. So again, thank you all very much. And uh, we'll, we'll be in touch again for hopefully another uh, discussion. Thank, Thank you for having us, Shalon. Bye.